you are perfectly evolved to thrive and survive on this planet. Isn't that good news? You are perfectly evolved to thrive and survive on this planet because our ancestors, our common ancestors, were put into put under pressure in some ways and were caused and forced to develop some traits that we have. We're starting a new series today, Evolved, 12 Spiritual Gifts from Human Evolution. I'm talking about 12 aspects of character, maybe uh, traits, uh, personal assets that we have. If we share these traits as humans, then they came to us through the process of evolution. And we could continue to evolve those traits, it turns out. We don't have to be stuck with the understanding that we're born with. I wasn't born with much of an understanding of the world. I had to develop that understanding. Now I'm a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and I just love watching that, that process evolve as a child grows to understand. One physical aspect that we developed, uh, that were developed for us by our ancestors, is a larger brain than other primates of the, of the same, with, with, with some of the same uh, qualities. Um, the large brain allowed us to solve big problems. Now, we don't need a big brain to solve the problems with nature. Chimps have that, gorillas have that, others, other primates have that. We use it for technology, yes. Uh, the technology of fire and the technology of, of, of shelter building allowed us to leave the equator, get out of the equator and take over the whole world, cover the whole world, and, and of course, we're ruining it. <laughs> but that's, that, that, that's an example of what, our, what we can do with our brain if we're not using understanding in a, um, in a mindful way. We did not need the big brain to survive. You know what we needed the big brain for? To get along with other people. Scientists now think, believe, that we developed the large brain for problem solving in society. We are hypersocial compared to other animals, compared to, other, compared to birds, compared to uh, uh, mammals, compared to, uh, to other animals. We are hypersocial. We live, we work, and we thrive in close proximity to other people. And we had to develop the ability to understand one another more deeply and to understand how to get our own needs met. In, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area, in a place where there's a lot of competition from other human beings. We had to develop the understanding, to, uh, the, the ability to understand ourselves more deeply. And that big brain gave us the, gave us the, 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 the complexity uh, and, and, uh, to, to, to be able to understand. Now this is, this is a, a complex topic and I'm just giving a, a very simple explanation for today, but that has to be enough. Have you heard of Occam's Razor? Occam's Razor is a, uh, is a, 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 a line in my mind that I've, I've, I've come, to, uh, I've come to, uh, to, to implant there through deepening my understanding of what it means. Uh, Occam's uh, uh, explanation is that, that the simplest explanation for a phenomenon is probably the right one. If we have to develop uh, complex stories for how something came up, it came into being, it's probably not the way it happened. It probably happened more simply than that. Uh, I have great respect for Occam's Razor. You'll hear it from, from me uh, 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 throughout this series. It's the, uh, it, for, 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 for big, on the big picture, Occam's Razor can give us the ability to distinguish mythology from reality because we humans have a deep connection to our symbols and to the, to the stories we tell. And the stories we tell, if we tell them over and over, we come to believe them. And I'm not just talking about religion, I'm not just talking about uh, fairy tales, I'm talking about science even, other, uh, uh, other forms of, of understanding. What I'm talking about with the faculty of understanding, the faculty of understanding, the insight, that comes through us, that we develop into understanding and the understanding that allows us to have greater insight. This is, uh, this is, this is 
uh, something akin to the belief system, but it's, it's not complete. You're familiar with the science of plate tectonics, aren't you? Yes. Continental drift, everything else that goes along with, uh, uh, with that foundational understanding of our planet. That concept was first proposed in 1922. And it didn't, uh, didn't get accepted by, by the majority of the of geologists until the mid-1960s, over 40 years. And still, by the mid-1960s, not everyone was willing to accept it. But why? Because like everyone, scientists were taught to believe things a certain way. And they came to believe it. That's part of being a good scientist. That misunderstanding had to be undone so that a better understanding could, be, could filter into its place. And that's the work we have to do. In response to an early re, um, proposal of the theory of, uh, of tectonic plates, the head of the Geological Society wrote that it's a particularly dangerous idea because the pieces of it fit together so well that there was a risk people might actually believe it. <laughs> it was a mythology. Mythology is, is the word I'm using for story. He had been told a story and story is the basic building block of understanding for a human. We all humans tell stories, so the capa capacity to tell stories came through what? It came through evolution. We eve evolved that ability. Lynn Sykes is, uh, uh, is now an, an emeritus professor of earth and environmental sciences at Columbia. He says this, I had been told as an undergraduate at MIT that good scientists do not work on foolish ideas like continental drift. <laughs> and of course he says it's now difficult to see why we didn't get it. Well, it's not that difficult. It's the belief system, the human belief system. There's a book that, uh, um, that I highly recommend. It's by a man named D.Q. McInerney. And the title is, Being Logical, A Guide to Good Thinking. And he says this in the section of, on being mindful of the, of the uh, origin of ideas, where they come from. He says this, we all tend to favor our own ideas, which is natural enough. They are, after all, in a sense, our very own babies, the conceptions of our minds. But conception is possible in the thinking subject only because of the subject's encounter with the world. Our ideas owe their existence ultimately to things outside and independent of the mind to which they refer, objective facts. Our ideas are clear and our understanding of them is clear only to the extent that we keep constant tabs on the things to which they refer. So if I talk about the sun, the word sun is a symbol. The word sun is not very hot, is it? The word, I can say the word sun, 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 sun. Nothing got hot. Sun, I can say sun over and over again. It's just a symbol. But the real sun is very hot. And if I talk about the sun as being in one place, and an hour later I'm still talking about the sun as being in one place in the sky, I'm going to be off, aren't I? Because the, the understanding has to change. Those ideas of things, uh, those ideas we have refer to things on the outside, but we have to constant, just constantly check and see and, and, and make sure that that's still, that's still true. Or we end up like that head of the geological society, clueless about his own, his own field because of the belief system that was too slow in coming around. We need to understand the nature of the world. That's our survival. That's even part of our thriving. We need to understand others. That's where most of our thought is given over. That's where most of our thought processes are, are given to. But we also need to understand ourselves. We need insight into what drives us, into what helps us understand. Today I'm talking about the faculty of understanding and laying the, laying the groundwork for work that we're going to be doing later as well. If I have a map, I've used this illustration before, if I have a map that tells me how to get around town, 
that map is going to be useful to me. I can drive and I can get to an intersection and I can look at my map and I can see where I am. Sometimes it's on the phone and it starts talking to me. But before that, now what good would this map do me if I have it right here while I'm driving? That's where our belief system is. Very often we have to pull that down, pull that down and use that understanding more completely and more, and more fully. Today I chose the animal symbol of the lion so that I could teach about symbolism. Did you know there are more statues of lions on this planet than there are real lions on this planet? They're everywhere. Statues of lions are everywhere. The, uh, um, so what does the lion represent? What does it symbolize? Sometimes the, the, the lion represents and, and symbolizes courage in our mythologies. Sometimes strength. Understanding and insight is another, uh, another aspect of the lion that shows up uh, in our stories, in our mythologies. There are aspects of ourself, aspects of others, aspects of the nature of the world that need to be understood. And we also have a fear of being understood. A fear of being understood. We think it's a fear of being misunderstood. We don't want to see, we don't pe pe want people to see aspects of ourselves, So we hide them away. We'll talk a little bit about, th about the shadow later. But when we have that fear of being understood, we start to put up, put up walls, and those walls impact our own ability to understand. When we hide parts of ourselves, we're hiding parts, those parts from ourselves, and we fail to understand fully what drives us, what impacts us, what inspires us. The lion is symbolic. What, what, what was the lion symbolic of at the, in the MGM opening? That was the first time I ever heard a lion roar, I think. It was <laughs> pardon? Good bear. Good bear. Great, yeah, it could very well be. Uh, the Wizard of Oz. The lion represented courage. In the Lion King, Simba represented, uh, a, a represented an individual coming through the processes to greater understanding. From, from, from a lack of understanding to full understanding. We understand the world symbolically. Story is the basic building block. Story is filled with symbolism and the symbols are, are, the, are, the, uh, uh, are, are the means through which we understand the world. When the faculty of, when the faculty of understanding is in balance, we understand or we know that we don't understand. When it's in balance, we understand or we know that we don't understand. It being in balance, having this faculty in balance, it leaves us with a sense of wonder and curiosity, deep curiosity. When it's out of balance, we think we know. We, we think we understand. We're closed off to some insight some new idea, we, the, the acceptance, uh, there, there's acceptance that is beyond our ex, uh, understanding and, uh, and this, this, this out of balance, uh, need to understand it, it, it drives what we do. Uh, the story of Pandora, remember the story of Pandora? She, her curiosity opened all the evils onto the world. When the faculty of, of understanding is out of balance, it can act that way for us. You remember the Lion King? The story of the Lion King? In the story of the Lion King, Simba, the young cub, is misled. Now he understands what happened, if you ask him. He understands that he killed his father. There's a new version of the Lion King coming out this fall. That's one reason I'm bringing it up. It's going to be everywhere. Uh, Simba understands that he killed his father. So his faculty of understanding is off balance. His faculty of understanding was, was used and misused by another, Scar, his uncle. Do you remember Scar? Now, Scar is symbolic of evil. And there's a little more to that that I'm going to come back to. We're going to put a pin, a pin in that. But Simba, Simba goes through his process. And one of his processes is to not care about the world. Hakuna Matata. 
Hakuna Matata. Oh, we don't have to worry about anything. We can just be ourselves all day. We can just play until he gets some news that adds some understanding. It shakes him out of that reverie. We have to be shaken out of that reverie sometimes. And he, he gets shaken out of the reverie. He comes to understand from his former playmate that, that, uh, that he did not kill um, his father and that, uh, that, 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 that pride needs help. And he goes back and, uh, of course, he saves the day. Now, I like Scar as a symbol in that movie. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell the whole story. Scar is symbolic of evil, isn't he? Symbolic of all those dark forces, the, 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 the selfishness of the ego, the, the thirst for power. But there's a lot more to it. In Western literature, there's a, there's a history of using disability or disfiguration to represent evil. Think of the one-armed man. Think of the one-armed man, Injun Joe. Any fans of, of the old Dick Tracy stock comic strip here? Dick Tracy comic strip, you always knew who the bad guy was because he had a misshaped head, or his head was flat, or it was too big, or it was too small, or he stuttered. There was some disfiguration that let the reader know this is a really bad guy. How unfair is that to people with disabilities and disfigurement? Oh, my God! Well, lions get scars. But these lions in the Lion King, they're named in a very special ceremony. And the naming is very, very meaningful. So Scar continues in that, that tradition and literature. If we don't understand that, we can't change the tradition. We need to do that for our, our, our fellow humans with disabilities and, and disfiguration. We need, to, we need to shift. That needs to be shifted. But it will only come when the understanding changes. And I'm not talking about my understanding or your understanding. I'm talking about blanket understanding. Group consciousness is what I'm referring to. In the field of religion, Jesus was known as the Lion of Judah by some. Now, all religion has three components. The philosophy, the mythology, the stories, and the practices. Now, you can have the Buddhist philosophy without the other two. You can have Christian philosophy without the other two. But when you add all those three together, you have what I call personal religion. And I'm not just talking about, about um, um, organized religion. I'm talking about a personal religion. There was a, a big kerfuffle when, I, uh, when one of the Narnia movies came out. Uh, uh, in recent years, C.S. Lewis series on the uh, on the the the, the, the fantastical uh, land of Narnia, and uh, it, that that those stories were are a perfect example of a mythology and religion uh, connection because uh, after one of those were, were, was made, uh, uh, there, there were some statements coming from from uh, from extremely conservative Christianity. About the, uh, about the movie and about the, uh, uh, the meaning of the movie. Well, the filmmaker pointed out that that movie could be, uh, the story of Narnia could be about any spiritual master, any process of spiritual mastery. It could be about spiritual mastery itself. And there was a huge uproar from Christianity. No, it's about Jesus. That's all it can symbolize. Well, guess what? Symbolism doesn't work that way. This faculty, the faculty of understanding, is one that we can continue to work with all of our lives. In fact, we need to work with it our entire lifetime because there's always something deeper to understand about ourselves. There's always something deeper to understand about others. And there's always something deeper to understand about our universe. Let's take a moment for meditation, if you will.